Okay, so we're gonna start our little conversation now. Um, uh, Zihan, I'm gonna turn my phone off. Um, uh, people will trickle in as they do. So, uh, yeah, I'm gonna wait for everyone else to get down here. Hey guys. Um, uh, welcome. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, it's been, uh, I'm glad that it's small, actually. It's kind of nice. We've never had an event uh, so intimate before. Um, and in a way, it like, feels like a little bit more pressure. <laughs> but uh, I'm so happy to have all of you here. And uh, to be able to talk to Zion a little bit more about his show and what it's all about. It's been. We got this space uh, in the summer of last year, so in October, it'll be a year that we've been putting on shows. And uh, all of the ABXY artists have had a solo show at the gallery in the first year, and Zihan's the last of the five. And uh, while sometimes being last sucks, sometimes it's awesome, because you get the benefit of watching everybody else go through it and uh, you learn a lot. And with Zihan's show, I think, well, with everyone's show, I've been thrilled to uh, see what they can each do with this space. I don't know if everybody knows this, but I, we all started working together out of my apartment in Soho, and uh, it was awesome to be able to see everybody's work develop and uh, to put on shows there. We did all kinds of things. Um, Um, uh, so we did shows and things like that, but, um, sorry, <laughs> but uh, to have this big, beautiful, white, sometimes white, space to play with, and uh, they will back me up on this. I do let you guys do whatever you want. Um, <laughs> uh, it's been really a pleasure so to get to see each one of you take over the space and make it fully yours has been uh, such a pleasure. And uh, Zihan really took it to the next level with uh, all of the components that he designed in the show. I mean, from the floors to the augmented reality component. If you haven't seen that, please ask us after this. Um, and uh, the augmented reality, the VR component, which is upstairs, which we'll go through in a bit, the dancing, everything. So. There's a lot, a lot of different art forms in this show, and uh, I'm super, super impressed and proud of you. So first of all, congratulations. Yay. <laughs> Woo. So uh, we're gonna start off talking a little bit about um, Z's history with dance. He uh, has a hip hop, you know, break dancing background. You're going to say it better, okay. So we're going to talk about Zihan's uh, dance background and kind of how it brought him to painting, right? Yeah, sure thing. Um, well, I didn't expect to be here today, so I really thank all you guys for being here just because it's, I'm really grateful to you guys for being here. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of my work is inspired by movement. The show is called Momentum, and um, I was, a, I was, I spent a large part of my life street performing and dancing, just mostly because, like, honestly, because of my immigration issue. Like, I just couldn't get a regular job, so I just, like, like leaned towards doing a lot of odd jobs and stuff. Now, like, I'm naturalized and it's a little bit better, but it was defining when I was, when I was a teenager, when I was trying to go through college, trying to apply to colleges, trying to apply to jobs or anything. And, yeah. Oh. Okay, I was born in Libya. Doesn't help me now. Never has. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm Bangladeshi by ethnicity. My parents were just like, you know, living there at the moment. And uh, so yeah, um, it's, been, it's been a long process in just naturalizing. So I really, you know, do feel for the people, for, for the DREAM Act and for, um, you know, just people trying to naturalize and dealing with immigration issues. It's, it just hits close to home for me because I've been here since I was two. And I'm still like, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a naturalized uh, uh, I'm a permanent resident, but I'm like still not a citizen, and it's kind of like crazy, whatever. 
I don't want to go into that further. But yeah, I mean, it kind of defined my uh, childhood or growing up because I leaned towards like doing really odd jobs. Um, I found that, you know, uh, dancing or street performing, like just taking the train along the way, like I always loved dancing as a kid, but I realized that I can make a buck, you know, just doing what I love. So like I held it down in Washington Square Park at Union Square for, for a minute. And honestly, like um, I tell dancers nowadays, you know, even the ones I meet at studios or like in other facets of, you know, dancing, to oh, to try just street performing for just a minute, just because, like, it was such an enrich enrich uh, enriching experience, you know, like, just, I mean, because my, my artwork isn't just um, inspired by dancing, but just all the movement around the city. And honestly, if you can, like, hold, if you can stop New Yorkers at Union Square or Washington Square or, like, at a subway station in mid-commute or, like, you know, in rush hour, then you can, you got some power in your hands, you know? And that's what I realized. And I got to really experiment with my dancing which uh, I, I was really fixated on until like, you know, I became 20, 22, and I realized, you know, I just couldn't really make a living out of it or support my family to that extent. And I started, I, I, I guess I leaned towards a more practical job of painting, I don't know. Um, but that's, that's where I was, you know, because it was hard for me to just like apply for a regular job when you don't have like a social security number or anything. So um, yeah, it was just like, I don't know, I always thought like, my life was going to be linear, you know, just being Asian. Like, my parents are like, you're going to study hard, go to med school, become a doctor, period. You know, like, but then we encountered so many obstacles, and uh, I just went on so many different tangents in my life. And I was just like, I didn't know how I was going to piece this all together, where this was going to end up. But um, all those different tangents in my life, I feel like, you know, if, and this applies to many different people, that if you step back, you'll kind of come to see how all those different um, tangents in your life just kind of converge to create like a more beautiful picture. That's if you really, you know, step back to look at it that way. Because otherwise it's all arbitrary. You know, I could have just been dancing, spent wasting my time dancing, wasting my time doing graffiti and whatever else, but like I wouldn't have been able to do what I do today had I not been dancing, had I not been doing graffiti and all those little random things that I do. Um, so yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, the, we need to get two mics maybe. Um, uh, so, no, I just, it's a, you know, it's one of those things. Um, uh, how did brands, dancing bring you into painting? Like, when did you start painting and where? And uh, what was it um, about dancing that, you know, we see in the paintings? Okay. So when I first started dancing, I, oh, sorry. Hold the mic. Yeah, I have to hold it. Um, maybe also tell us about kind of how that shows up in the augmented reality. Cool, cool. Um, well, when I first started dancing, uh, I was doing uh, hip hop, like break dancing, popping. Uh, uh, so like, um, I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with hip hop in general. There's like four elements of hip hop. It's like pop, uh, it's like break dancing, graffiti, MC, DJ, Sometimes beatboxing, I don't know, it's like a fifth one that it's kind of fallen off, but anyways, it's still cool. Um, but yeah, um, so when I got into like breakdancing, I got introduced to graffiti at the same time. Um, I wasn't so musically inclined myself, I would have tried rapping if I could, it wasn't that great. <laughs> anyways, um, but yeah, uh, but yeah, so like I really just kind of focused in on like doing graffiti and uh, dancing at the same time, and I realized that like a lot of my dexterity from dancing like a lot of my movements are very linear, and um, they really converted really easily when I held a spray paint or like or, or, or marker in my hand. So like I'm literally like dancing when I'm creating a lot of this, a lot of these paintings, and like, and I need to sort of like have this momentum in my movement. Otherwise, you'll see the hesitation in my lines, and uh, it's actually helped me out uh, explore other mediums really easily as well, like virtual reality, because like when I'm working in VR and I'm like 3D painting or whatever else, like I have no friction to work against like I do on a canvas or whatever else. So that dexterity really converts easily and, and like allows me to create like really crisp, sharp lines in this 3D space. So like I find myself dancing when I'm creating like these 3D paintings now and these 3D sculptures, which I can elaborate upon later. But um, in regards to uh, the AR installation, the augmented reality installation, I wanted people to see the correlation between my line work and my movement. So uh, I did this augmented reality installation. I don't know if you guys are familiar with augmented reality, but it allows you to overlay images or, or visuals on top of images. So um, I recorded myself dancing. It was 
It was a makeshift process where I recorded myself in my living room. And then uh, I extracted my silhouette and uh, I worked with this developer. Like honestly, like yeah, this show is a solo show, but it was really a collaboration. It was a culmination of like many different forces, you know, Ali, uh, 3D printers, my friend Nick, Alex, engineers. Like they, it was a lot of people that like I just crossed paths with, and I think you know that was something you know just comes back to the element of synchronicity and how just things kind of just come together. Um, but yeah, um, the AR installation, which I'll show you guys later, does like sort of correlate or show how my movement is kind of compressed into canvas. Um, I think that was a, a really natural segue into talking about the virtual reality upstairs and uh, like telling people kind of how that works and what they will now be able to see if they put that headset on. Is it working? Okay. Shortly upstairs, there will be, you can put on the, um, the it's an HTC Vive, right? It's a headset, like a VR headset, and uh, you'll be able to see sculptural work that Zihan's created in three dimensions, and uh, also the drawing that you just did? Okay, um, but yeah, you just wanna tell us about it a little bit more, like the process and uh, why it was useful to you and why designing in VR is, uh, allows you to do things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Um, well, I mean, some people, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I could grab a little sculpture. Um, so I don't like to impose technology upon my artwork. Uh, I just use it when I feel like it was necessary. I thought it really conveyed the point in what I was doing. Um, like, so uh, in regards to the VR stuff, uh, everyone's really excited about VR. What I really wanted to do was like take VR and create something concrete out of it, sort of bridge that gap with two emerging technologies. So like I designed these, these sculptures in virtual reality and I had them 3D printed, which is also a fairly new process. So like, I designed it in such a way that you kind of had to 3D print it, because like, I didn't want to make something you could just like carve out of stone. I wanted to create something intricate and interweaving that you had to s essentially 3D print. And honestly, like, it cost a fortune to 3D print, so I was like, all right, might as well design something that's worth 3D printing. Um, so yeah, this is, this is uh, something I created in virtual reality. So like, these swivels that you see, I'm literally holding and like kind of dancing with the controller, like just spinning around to just to create these sort of lines with cleaner, um, sort of like this, uh, just have clean lines essentially. Um, but yeah, yeah, I use this program called Google Blocks to sort of uh, create object files which are actually printable. So like before you had like 3D painting, but it wasn't anything you can actually like print or it wasn't anything conceivable. All of this technology is re relatively primitive, so I just wanted to be on the forefront of it. So yeah, that's why I'm just like experimenting and playing with some of these smaller sculptures. But once uh, the virtual reality machine, uh, the Vive is working, you can see it in larger scale and the platform in which I built it. Yeah. Um, I thought when I was trying to write about what Zihan was doing, it was challenging for me because this is not my world. Uh, the VR like tech, you know, aspect of, of it and uh, I thought one of the interesting, easy ways that somebody put it on the internet was uh, it solves the problem of designing 3D objects on a 2D surface, whether that's a monitor or a notepad or whatever. Um, being able to have uh, a third dimension just allows you to see things in a completely different way and design things in a completely different way. Um, cool. What else was I going to ask you about? Look at my notes. The VR, oh, designing the sculptures you designed in virtual reality. What was our next section? Interactive projection mapping, great, there we go, thank you for not making me look at my notes. Okay, so, um, uh, another aspect, and I actually haven't seen uh, this play out yet, we're all about to see it for the first time, I think only Zihan's seen it. We uh, added a, Projection, mapping. Yeah. You know what? I'm gonna let Zihan tell you about it. It's gonna be really cool. We're gonna after this, we're gonna turn out the lights for a second um, to kind of set up for it. So just bear with us during that. That's about to happen. But you just tell us. Cool. Uh, I actually collaborated with my friend Chewy over there, um, fellow dancer. Actually, I, like 
random, but that's how it works in New York City. Um, but yeah, so um, she does all this cool projection art and work, and she collaborated with me to map and create an interaction proje uh, interactive projection mapping for this painting. So essentially, when you move in front of it, the, the painting will seem as if it moves with you. So I mean, like I said, people really see paintings to be archaic and static in this world where there's just constant movement for your attention, you know? So I just wanted to find a way that I could just find this middle ground between the two. Um, so it's just a painting by day, but when it gets dark, it becomes something more. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah, that was a lovely way to put that. Um, I love it. So after the projection situation, around 8.30, there will be another dance performance. And uh, the performance is called Last Stop. Um, and would you mind telling us kind of the inspiration behind that, behind the piece? Um, so I just came up with this little dance performance, and I call it Last Stop. It's essentially to show how like movement is relative, also just like how I, I wanted to exhibit how uh, my artwork was all relative on different scales, like I thought of this gallery floor like um, this gallery to be like a canvas in its own and I also have like this small 3D print and I want people to fixate their attention on something large and small, that disparity of sizes as well. So I mean with this, with this sort of um, performance I also wanted to show the relativity of movement and so the story is essentially six different dancers of different backgrounds um, on a train car and we're like pantomiming being on a train car. And I thought, you know, it's a way, another way of showing how movement is relative because we're all dancers, not like, you know, the Showtime dancers who are dancing. Sometimes, you know, we're just day-to-day -day regular people where we dance, you know, we're dancers by night or whatever you want to call it. Um, that sounds weird. Um, but, I mean, no, like, we just dance, you know, as hobbies and whatever else or passions, so to say. Yeah, but, yeah, essentially. So, I mean, but we're on a, we're on a train car, essentially, and um, the train conductor leads off each dancer to their to their own destination, and the dancing sort of concludes each story. So I hope you guys are around to to, to witness that. It's all freestyle, really. So um, we all of it's really improvised. My artwork, the dancing, all of it. So hopefully you enjoy all of it. <laughs> it's pretty special. We did it at the opening. Um, I also, just before we wrap up, I wanted to. I know it's a little bit of a circle back, but the show was really based on the Alchemist. Thank you. Um, this show was based, well, inspired by The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho. I don't know how to, s Coelho? Okay, pronunciation is a little bit. Um, uh, but uh, for the spelling, you can see the press release, which is available upstairs. Um, and uh, can you just tell us like what that book means to you and how it relates to the work that we're looking at? And maybe also the, the design of the floor, you know? So um, The Alchemist has like, almost been like a Bible to me. It's like a short little parable, and I think a lot of people can find it like very useful in different pivotal moments of their life, or just, I don't know, it's a really short read, but if you get the time, read it. If not, um, I'll slowly, I will tell you how it inspired me. So essentially, when I designed this floor space, um, I think of life as, I think of lines as life, and many times, like metaphorically. So like when you're standing up there, you see how like this this path sort of curves around, and um, you don't really see where it ends, and it's like this unforeseen sort of like destination. And I think a lot of times you don't really see where you're going in life, but it throws you a, like a curveball or wherever else. It throws you off a lot of times. But if you just continue down your path, you'll find this little treasure, which is like figurative of like that gold 3D print essentially. But in the book, it's uh, the alchemist. It's about a shepherd looking for his treasure, and uh, he encounters many different tangents in his life, as I did. And, but he just follows this sort of momentum. These little things happen in all of our lives. You know, it may not be painting or art or whatever else, but I think it's up to us to see the meaning behind it because otherwise it's completely all arbitrary, you know, and not, it no, doesn't build up to anything if you don't see it to. So, like, um, I don't know. I took note of the little things that happened in my life. Sometimes they were good. Sometimes they were bad. I failed art every time I took it. But, you know, I, yeah, I did. Um, but, you know, who is teaching me anyways? I mean, they're teaching art anyways. <laughs> Uh, those who can't teach, not always true. Anyways, um, but yeah, so, um, yeah, I just stuck to it, you know? Uh, whether it was just like a compliment or whether it was like, you know, winning a little art contest, I just stuck to it and it built up to something bigger. I didn't expect to see myself here. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just um, really grateful that you guys are here and sharing this moment with me. And I think that you were meant to be here, you know, 
Well, you guys could be anywhere, really. But I think you're meant to be here in this time and place for a reason, whatever it is. So, yeah. Thank you. Me too. Me too. Um, uh, does anyone have? Hey, Max. Does anyone have any questions for Zion? Anything anybody wants to ask? Yeah. You looked like you had a question, Andy. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, I mean, in terms of, like, culture, like, when I think of my culture, honestly, like, like, someone asked me, what do you, what do you consider yourself first? I think of, like, myself as a New Yorker first and foremost. I live on a New York minute. I'm always hustling and bustling. Like, you know, I think moving is living. And um, so when I think about culture and hip-hop culture, like, some people do notice, like, the graffiti and the movement in my work. What's foreign or different is, like, this color palette. And I wanted, to, like, so, like, when I was, I was doing graffiti and I got thrown into a gallery. And I'm just, like, I always use, like, you know, really vibrant colors, like, pimp violet, you know, like, or, like, code red or whatever, just to catch people's eyes on the streets. But, like, once I got thrown into this gallery, I, I don't know, I, I didn't want to sell out, per se, but I wanted to create, like, or uh, something I'm comfortable with, but also, like, this infusion of, like, this luxury palette and fine art. And, like, so I want to take hip-hop to a different place. That's why I have this dance performance, because honestly, I see a lot of weird-ass performance art. And, like, there's so much incredible, like, talent that goes unseen in, like, you know, just the darkness of clubs or, like, in a dance battle. Like, you know, it, you never see at a gallery, and I think it's beautiful, and it inspires a lot of my movement, you know? So, um, yeah, uh, I just thought this dance performance was necessary just to sort of exhibit that. But, no, I mean, that's a great question, yeah. Uh, it is a great question. Talking. Oh, well, also, if you're referring to like my culture as in like being Asian, um, I've I've like been enticed to sort of like incorporate that, but I've always told myself like I want to create timeless artwork that like people would be able to find at any time and place. And I feel like once I create like you know an Asian woman or a figuration of some sort, then there's a lot of people who are just maybe not relating to it. So like that's that's yeah, I guess that's something I've always wanted to do. Although, your Rorschach series, so Zihan, the black and white piece that's uh, upstairs, um, is from a series of work called the Rorschach series, and they're designed to be like, or they're conceived to be kind of reverse Rorschach tests. So, whereas you see an ink blot that is totally random, right? Like, that's a Rorschach test. You look at an ink blot and you're like, oh, you know, like how you look at the clouds. It looks like an elephant. It looks like my parents fighting. It looks like, you know, whatever. And it reveals your trauma. Um, uh, in Zihan's, Zihan's work looks very, very abstract at first, and some of it really is. But, like, in the piece upstairs you'll see, there are these uh, very personal references to you or shapes, at least, that are meaning shapes and lines and designs that are meaningful to you that uh, might, that at first appear not recognizable. But the longer you stand and look at them, the more you start seeing, like, oh, that, that reminds me of this. And you bring your own kind of references to the piece. And uh, what I like about that is it reminds us how we look for common ground with anything we spend time with. Um, anything you really sit and interact with and look at and have to spend time with, it's going to make you uh, try and find that place of, of commonality, um, even though your experiences are, are widely different. So I don't know, do you want to, did I describe the Rorschach things okay? Yeah, yeah. You want to talk about it more? Uh, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I like using abstraction because, uh, I mean, I study psychology and what, what really interests me is like neuroplasticity and how like, 
just to maintain my creativity. That's always been like a, my own personal sort of interest of sorts. And I feel like, you know, as we grow older, we just like look at clouds and they're just clouds. But when we're younger, we see so much more. And really, the brain is just a muscle and so is creativity. And I feel like the more you practice it, um, that stretch of imagination, the more youthful and imaginative you, you remain, essentially. And that's sort of like the, the theory of neuroplasticity. So uh, I like people sort of like looking at my work and making that you know, stretch to see something that they find p familiar. And many times it's really projective, you know? So it's, it's funny when people say, hey, is that you know, based off a of textile pattern or something? It's like, are you a fashion designer? Hey, how do you know? Like, oh, okay. So you know, it's, it's really projective a lot of times and it's interesting. You learn a lot about what people see and uh, you can assume things, but it's better not to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, Andy, did that answer your question? Is anyone else uh, feeling brave? Curious? No, okay. Well, if you would like to talk to Zihan afterwards, he'll be here. Um, again, bear with us. It might go dark in here for a couple of minutes while we set up the projection, but it's gonna be totally worth it. So stick around, get a glass of wine, have an empanada. They are from, uh, where are they from, Griff? Harlem. Harlem. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're really, really good. Um, uh, and uh, thank you guys all for being here. Thank you everyone who helped make today possible. I'm looking at you girls. My interns are pretty big superstars and we're very grateful for them. Okay, yeah, cheers. cheers.